So in the last lecture, I started talking about this empty formalism objection, this idea that Kant's principles seem good, they sound nice, but when push comes to shove, they don't really do any work. The idea is, well, you know, we know what's right and wrong, or at least in cases like, you know, the murder at the door, and, you know, we just set up people who like Kant's principles, being we at least, just set up Kant's principles in a way to get the answer that we already know is true. Well, if that's true, then, you know, Kant's moral theory just seems dispensable, right? If it doesn't do any work, why have it as a moral theory? So I want to address that objection in this lecture. I think it's worth taking, se taking seriously, but I do think Kant has some things to say. Now, you will often hear this empty formalism objection described as Hegel's empty formalism objection. Hegel was a philosopher who lived a bit after Kant. Kant died, well, their lives overlapped, but they really, they never met each other, they never talked to each other. Um, and so Hegel, you know, made this criticism. Kant was very, his ethics were very influential when Hegel started writing. And Hegel was one of the first to really make this criticism. Well, look, you can just describe whatever you're doing in a way that it'll pass Kant's formula of universal law. Anything can get through the formula of universal law. It just depends on how you describe it. So Hegel says, well, then Kantianism isn't doing any real work. Well, is that true or not? What would Kant say to that? Well, let's just see if it passes the, the smell test here, right? And look, it certainly seems to me that Kant's formula of humanity rules some things out. And it rules some things out that other moral theories would allow, right? You cannot cut a person up for his organs to save any number of lives because that's using him as a mere means. Well, utilitarianism certainly gives a different answer. It certainly seems that Kant's theory is ruling something out. And it certainly seems that Kant's theory is going to give us some very clear answers in cases where we're less morally sure, right? You might say, well, the cutting up some of his organs case, who cares there? Only the utilitarian thinks that that's okay. But think about Truman's decision to drop the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That's controversial. People argue about it. People still aren't sure whether this was wrong or right. I'm going to guess if I polled you guys, there would be a lot of disagreement. Well, but guess what? Kant's principles very clearly give us an answer here. We don't agree on this. It's not as though we have the right answer and we're just setting Kant's principles up to get that answer. Well, no, we might not agree, but Kant's principles tell us you should not do this. You would be using the civilians in Hiroshima and Nagasaki as mere means. And, of course, you know, Kant lived in the 1800s, or sorry, he lived in the 1700s, died in the very early 1800s. So Kant, of course, had no experience with Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but... Kant did, you know, colonialism, European powers, colonizing and exploiting countries, you know, all over the rest of the world, that was the thing in Kant's time, right? And many people actually supported colonialism, right? You would get these people who are saying, oh, you know, these people are less advanced, we can do what we want, or they're less advanced, we'll force them to go into the future. And Kant was 100% against colonialism. Kant said, you can't, you European powers can't impose your will on these people. They are rational beings. They might not have the technology we do. They're still rational. You are using them as a mere means by colonizing their country. And what's funny here is that Kant himself, as a young man, actually seemed to support colonialism. He had no real troubles with it, 
And then after he developed his moral theory, which he didn't until he was pretty far into middle age, he pretty suddenly rethought colonialism. He turned against it. And the evidence is, you know, we'd never have Kant saying in a letter or anything like that, I've rethought this, my moral theory says it's wrong. But all the evidence we have says that Kant rethought his position because he come up, came up with this moral theory and he realized the moral theory ruled it out. And I don't care how clever you are in setting up Kant's principles, there's no way you can get Kantianism to support something like the Hiroshima Nagasaki bombings or to support something like colonialism. Now one of the interesting things here, you'll notice that I'm using the formula of humanity. It actually seems like it's easier to misuse the formula of universal law than it is the formula of humanity. Hegel himself picks on the formula of universal law a lot. He doesn't like it. But even in his empty formalism complaint, Hegel doesn't mention the formula of humanity. This has led a lot of modern philosophers to say, well, look, the better of Kant's formulations, the one that we're going to work with is the formula of humanity. It gets at what's important better than the formula of universal law, and it's harder to misuse. Well, does that mean problem solved? Well, no, it doesn't. Kant's principles. Now, remember I said Kant wanted the basic principles to have the certainty of mathematics. Well, but Kant's principles, the ap applying Kant's principles, don't have that certainty. Even the formula of humanity, it sounds very good to say always respect other people as ends in themselves. But it's often very hard to figure out what that is. Now don't get me wrong, as I've said in many cases that's very clear, right? You're using someone as a mere means if you kill them for their organs. Dropping the atomic bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki were using the innocent civilians there as mere means. But other cases aren't so clear. Imagine that, you know, I'm a factory owner and you live in the town where my factory is and really the only job in town is at my factory. I offer you a very low, not at all generous wage. You choose to accept it. Am I using you as a mere means? You have a choice, but is it a real choice? You know, in that case, I'm, I'm kind of inclined to say that if I'm the factory owner, I am, but you might not be, right? And, and we can tinker with the case to where it becomes even more unclear, right? What about when I decide, you've probably done this at a flea market, what about when I decide to haggle with you? Let's say you have something for sale and you have $200 on it and I really just want to get it, I just want to knock off 20 or $30 and I say, well, this is nice, but there's no way I could pay more than 120 And you don't even really want 200 for it. You'd be happy, but you'll take less. And you're like, goodness, you know, 200s already cheap. It, it would be a crime against God and man if I took less than 190 I couldn't do it. Both of us are lying to each other, right? Each of us would take way, would pay more or take less than he or she says. Are we using each other as mere means? Again, I'm tempted to say no just because of the situation, but notice that things start to get complicated, right? Now look, we can go more and more deeply into this, but we start to get into this question, well, when do we really respect people's ability to act for reasons? Some cases we clearly do. If I say, I'll sell it to you for 20, and you say, okay, 20 is a good price, here's 20, we've both textbook case respected each other's reasons. 
if you hold a gun to someone's head, say, give me all your money, that's textbook. You haven't respected the reasons you've treated them as a mere means. But there are all these cases in between, and we might worry that Kantianism doesn't give us a clear answer. So the empty formalism overstates its case. It says, well, Kantianism, Kant's formulations do no work, but we might really worry that they don't do enough. How would Kant respond to that? Well, the kinds of people who usually put this objection to Kantianism tend to be utilitarians. And I think that one thing Kant might say is that he and the utilitarians have a different idea of what the point of a moral theory is. The utilitarian really does seem to think, well, one of the points, one of the functions of a moral theory is just to give us an almost mathematically neat scientific answer to every problem. The utilitarian says, well, we need a theory to clean up common sense morality and to give us answers to any unclear cases there might be out there. That's not really the main thing that Kant seems to want a moral theory to do. Kant's theory will do that in some cases, but that doesn't seem to be the main thing. Kant, in his moral theory, wants to make our duties clear. And Kant says, well, notice how much he talks about sound common sense in the groundwork that I had you read. Kant thinks that morality, moral theory, is really just making explicit what people already think. Then you might say, well, what's the point of moral theory? Well, the point, Kant would say, is to make it clearer. We know what our duty is, Kant would say, but we have a habit of making duty much more comfortable to ourselves. We are very good at talking ourselves into believing something's right when we know it isn't. You know, imagine I'm up for a promotion at work, and my nearest rival, there's some horrible rumor spreading about him. I, I know it's not true. I could stop it and I, I just let it go around, right? Maybe I'm even tempted to spread it in some way that I'm, you know, well, I heard. I know that's wrong, right? But I might try to convince myself. I might be, well, you know, let me think of the consequences. I'll be better at the job. You know, I'll use the money from the raise better. Or, you know, you find someone's wallet with $500 in it, right? you know you should return it, but you might start thinking, well, I'll use the money better. It's his fault for losing it. You know, why not keep it? Maybe I'll even give some to charity. Kant says we do this kind of thing constantly. And Kant would say utilitarianism is a temptation to do this kind of thing. Kant would say the point of moral theory is to make it very clear, well, one of the points of moral theory is to make it very clear what our duties are, to check our, to stop our propensity to deceive ourselves about them. On some level, we know what the moral rules are, Kant would say, but he wants to make them very explicit. The bigger problem is not that we don't know what to do, or so says Kant, the bigger problem is we know what to do, but we talk ourselves out of it. And Kant thinks by his moral theory, in these cases where, you know, like returning the wallet or lying about a coworker, where it's very clear what to do, his theory will help by making moral commands, moral rules clearer. Well, then you might say, well, what about the hard cases? Well, we've already seen Kant's theory will give us some clear answer in some of those. But I think Kant would say two things. One thing is just this. Moral problems are hard. And, you know, at least some moral problems are hard. And think about what you think about any theory that makes a hard moral problem easy. 
Well, Kant would say that theory probably makes it easy by missing something, by leaving something out. Utilitarianism, at least in some cases, seems like it gives us very clear answers. But, as in the organ case, you know, cutting out for his organs, those answers seem completely crazy. Or, as in keeping the child locked away so our city can be prosperous, as in Le Guin's story. And it gives us those clear, crazy answers because it leaves out important things. So I think, a Kant, you know, Kant doesn't quite say this, but a Kantian could say, it's no merit if a theory gives us clear answers, if those answers overlook the facts, and if those answers are wrong. But I think Kant would say one more thing, and, and in fact he does say this in, a, in another essay. Look, it might not be easy to solve moral problems, but at least Kant could say his theory points the way forward. Kant would say, look, we're all rational beings, we all act for reasons, well, one of the ways to see if you're treating someone as a mere means is just to go out and talk to people, have a moral discussion. Could your, not just have a discussion with people, but think back to what Nagel says about looking people in the eye. Could your reasons for your action, could you look the person in the eye and say that? You know, the keeping the wallet case or the coworker case, you definitely couldn't. A lot of other cases, like my factory owner case, if you actually had to look the person in the eye and explain, or I, I guess I'm the factory owner example, if I had to explain it, it would be an odd thing to say to the person, right? So Kant would say, think about justifying yourself to the other person. Think about, could you say this in a way that you are fully respecting them as a person? If you couldn't, that will give you one sign something's off. And even if it's still unclear, just go talk with people. The way that we figure out what does and doesn't treat people as mere means, at least in complicated cases, is to talk with the people affected. So, no, the theory doesn't give you neat answers, but that's maybe not a problem, and the theory at least makes some suggestions about how you can do the work to get answers. And I think the final thing Kantianism would say is that, well, look, think about what Nagel says about Vietnam. Utilitarianism seems to give clear answers, but Kant and Kantians would push back and say, well, utilitarianism in a lot of cases, it only gives you clear answers if you make assumptions about consequences that maybe you're not in a position to make. If we assume that we know exactly what will happen if we intervene in Vietnam, and we know exactly what will happen if we don't, then utilitarianism would be clear. But we can't even be clear what would happen in a lot smaller cases so the Kantian will say, just how good is utilitarianism at giving us the guidance it claims to give us? The Kantian will say, not nearly as good as they make out to be. And finally, you know, Kant will admit that, you know, the moral rules his system gives you might require some common sense, some judgment to apply, but Kant will say, so does any good rule, right? I could describe some rule from baseball to you, and if you've never seen a baseball game before and go to one tomorrow, you couldn't apply the rule. I'm not going to do it, but I could give you, let's imagine you've never seen a baseball game, I could give you a long description of the infield fly rule. You probably, if you had never seen a game before, couldn't go to one tomorrow and figure out when and how that applies. That doesn't mean that rule is useless, it just means you need some common sense to apply it. Kant would say the same thing about his moral principles. Yes, you need common sense to apply them. No, that doesn't mean they're useless. <laughs>